Donnelly, a small sailboat, was anchored in the river. The mouth of the river theme stretched before us like the beginning of an endless waterway. Nearby, barges sailing up the river seemed to stand still. The air was dark above the port town of Gravesend. There were five people on the Nelly. The director of companies was our captain and our host. On the whole river, there was nothing that looked half as appropriate as he did. There was bond of the sea between us. The long periods at sea, separated from everyone else, brought us closer together and made us tolerant of each other's stories and beliefs. The lawyer, a great guy, got to use the only cushion on the deck because he served on board for so long. The accountant had brought out already a box of dominoes and was toying architecturally with the bones. Marlowe, who had sunken cheeks, a yellow complexion, sat cross-legged right aft, leaning against the mizzenmast like a statue of a god. For ages, the river has performed good service to the people who live on its banks. The river's tides carry the memories of the men and ships they brought home or took into battle with, the sacred fire of civilization. The dreams of men, the beginnings of nations, and the seas of empires had all sailed its waters. The sun set. For the rest, the sky above the monstrous town was still gloomy and dark under the light of the stars. And this also, said Marlowe suddenly, has been one of the dark places of the earth. Marlowe tells how harsh and wild this place was for a Roman captain and military, and he mentions how they were brutal to the people who already lived there. After a long silence, Marlowe recounts his experience as a captain of a steamship going up the Congo River. Bored from the relaxation on the continent after the voyage through Asia for six years, he started to seek for a new voyage. Meanwhile, he finds a place in Africa with a mighty big river resembling an immense snake uncoiled and he recalls that a company for trade runs a business on that river. As he predicts there must be a steamship for the trade business, he decides to get a job of the company. Soon, Molo hears that he has gotten the captain of the steamship and went to the company's office across the English Channel. He hears that the reason he could be the captain without any progress was because Fred Levin, a previous captain of the ship, was stabbed by the ship's son of natives. At the company's office, one woman, knitting black wool, leads him to a waiting room where he looks at a map of Africa of which he is really enthusiastic. Then a secretary takes him into an inner office and he shakes hands with the head of the company, which means he confirmed his voyage. After Marlowe signs his contract, the secretary takes him to a doctor who checks Marlowe's pulse and confirms he was healthy enough to go to Congo. Then the doctor measures Marlowe's skull at the same time, remarking that he did not see men who came back from Africa. Also, the doctor tells Marlowe the changes take place inside. He believes his position as a doctor can give advantages to Belgians in colonial situations. After leaving the doctor, Marlowe visits his aunt to say goodbye and chats with a cup of tea for the last time. Marlowe's aunt talks about how proud she is of his nephew and how she believes he will ignite the civilization of savages in his service under the company. However, Marlowe has this feeling of him becoming an imposter since he is aware of the fact that the company does not operate for the good of humanity but for profit. When he arrives at the mouth of the Congo River, he boards another steamship which captain was a young Swede. The Swede recognized Marlowe being a seaman and invited him on the bridge. Then the Swede and Marlowe have a short conversation in which Swede mocks the colonial officials and tells how another Swede recently hanged himself. When he lands on the company's station, he sees piles of decaying machinery and rusty rails. He also sees a cliff being blasted which he finds no reason. As he turns his head, he sees a group of black prisoners in chains walking under the guard of another black man who wears a shoddy uniform and carries a rifle. Marlowe stands still on the hillside and recollects the scene of black prisoners in a row. He's really shocked at the greed and heartlessness of men. But at that time, he remains still and frozen. 
He goes across the halls and trenches, deeming the shade of trees as gloomy circle of some inferno. He observes the black workers in the hill, he depicts them as some inhuman creatures dying slowly in harsh conditions, and describes the stack of dead workers as a massacre. He returns to the station office. He contrasts the white man, the company's chief accountant, with a clean and neat garment to the black workers. He thinks the station is a complete mess and chaos, telling the ten days there as an eternity. Then he learns about Kurtz. He hears that Kurtz is a remarkable first class agent who is in charge of the trading post in the jungle. The accountant asks Marlowe to tell Kurtz that everything is very satisfactory. He leaves the station the next day with a caravan and goes on a 200 miles tram. He describes the path into the jungle as a road where no human traces are found. He passes some abandoned villages and ruins. Sixty barefoot workers carrying sixty pound luggages followed him. He encounters a few white men in the journey who came here for making some sheer money. He finally arrives at the central station, surrounded by the forest and mud wall on one side. A stout man with black mustaches tells Marlowe that his steamer, which has to be commanded by him, has sunk. Under the charge of some volunteer skipper, the general manager pulls out the steamer from the reef. Unfortunately, he realizes that it will be taken several months to repair it. Marlowe suspects that the sunk of the steamer was somewhat intended by the general manager. The general manager doesn't have any outstanding talents, but instead he seemed creepy and kept making Marlowe uncomfortable, which was expressed by him as an easiness. The manager tells him that Kurtz got sick, which caused some concerts from the company, but also praised him as an exceptional agent. One of the days waiting for the steamer to be repaired, a shed burned down and a number of native neighbors danced delightedly. He recognizes that it was caused by one of the laborers during the fuss, Marlowe accidentally hears some conversation between the manager and the brickmaker about carts. After seeing the manager leaving, he follows the brickmaker to his quarters, which looks more luxurious than other agents. He told Marlowe the, the information about the intentions of the company's board in Europe. Marlowe asks the unusual painting which is describing a blindfolded woman with a lighted torch on the wall and he answers that it is Kurt's work. From the meeting with the brickmaker and Kurtz, Marlow received some information about Kurtz from the brickmaker that he was sent as an emissary of enlightenment and civilization with noble purposes. The brickmaker then confesses that he had seen the company's confidential correspondence about Marlow's appointment, um, he believing Marlow was favored by the people in an administration who sent Kurtz. When Marlow and the brickmaker went outside, Marlowe noticed that the brickmaker wanted to become the assistant manager, but its efforts were impeded by the arrival of Kurtz. Marlowe lets the brickmaker believe he had influence in Europe so that he could get more information about Kurtz and acquire rivets to repair his ship. The brickmaker suddenly changes the topic of conversation to a hippopotamus with bad habits before leaving that the brickmaker seemed disturbed and puzzled. Marlowe found the foreman on the deck and he told the foreman that they will get the rivets within three weeks, rejoicing together. But the rivets did not come. Um, instead, a group of white men, calling themselves El Dorado Exploring Expedition, came to Marlowe. Marlowe gets disappointed and resigns his thoughts about getting, receiving rivets. However, he becomes curious about who Kurtz is, what are his moral ideas, and how he sets his work in Congo.